We must make the advanced premium tax credit expansion from the American Rescue Plan permanent and close the Medicaid coverage gap in the Build Back Better Act. We have a once in a generation opportunity to make high quality health care affordable and accessible to all. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Dan Diamond, a national health reporter for The Post, and this is part of our series on health equity. My first guest today is Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. She's a Democrat from Illinois, a registered nurse, the co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, and she is returning to Washington Post Live. Congresswoman, welcome back to the program. Hi, Dan. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too over the uh, power of the internet. Let's get started with recent efforts on reform in Congress and healthcare specifically. Healthcare, it's an important piece of the budget reconciliation package. President Biden suggested that the top line number for that package could range from $1.9 trillion to $2.2 trillion. Now that's a decrease, Congresswoman, from the initial $3.5 trillion figure that Democrats were aiming for. That could mean that key healthcare priorities have to get a haircut or maybe only be short-term funded in some cases. You've met with President Biden on these issues. You've talked to congressional leaders. What have those conversations been like? What are some of the trade-offs and concessions that might need to be made to fund these healthcare priorities? In my conversations with President Biden and the congressional leaders uh, that I serve with, it, I've been extremely clear that we cannot build back better if Americans don't have access to affordable health care. And so at the end of the day, we are remaining laser focused on keeping our promise to the American people, which is to deliver for them affordable health care solutions. In this construct of the Build Back Better Act, all of the health care provisions are being paid for by allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. Now, Dan, you're very familiar with this issue because it was central. It was key to our victories in 2018, enabling us to flip the House and hold the House majority as Democrats. This is something that the American people overwhelmingly support um, because so many have experienced the high cost of insulin or the high cost of a life-saving prescription drug that they're looking for some relief. It is incredible that we have an opportunity right now to make good on that promise to lower folks' prescription drug prices and take those savings and push them right back into healthcare, allowing us to lower premium prices, right? To, to in, um, close the Medicaid coverage gap for those states that didn't take advantage of Medicaid expansion under the ACA, right? We have this really rich opportunity uh, to make good on these coverage gains and lower out-of-pocket costs um, by embracing and expanding and making permanent the very, very, very popular tax cuts that were included in the American Rescue Plan. Congresswoman, we spoke about a month ago for a Washington Post story about the state of those health care priorities in the reconciliation package. You told me at the time you were pretty confident that Democrats were going to be able to get this done, that some of the divisions in the caucus were overblown in the media. But in the subsequent weeks, we've seen Democrats miss the September deadline they had set for themselves to vote on the bill. It's come out that Senator Manchin, some other Democrats have concerns about the size of the package and the need for a haircut. Are, are you as confident in the state of reconciliation and that Democrats can get this done as you were when we spoke a few weeks ago? Absolutely. We are going to pass this Build Back Better Act. We are going to pass the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Investment Act, and we will have a great opportunity to make key investments to improve the lives and the health and well-being of the American people. This is, um, at its core, a jobs bill, um, and ensuring economic security for families all across our country, whether we're talking about paid family leave or affordable child care, whether we're talking about affordable um, 
uh, community college, right? So the two free years of community college or making workforce investments, or whether we're talking about these healthcare issues, right? Making sure the American people are healthy to go to work, healthy to raise their families, healthy to have full careers and enjoy their retirement days. Um, this is essential to President Biden's agenda. I think that the discussion that we're having right now is appropriate, right? We're talking about key federal investments um, that will touch the lives of Americans across the lifespan. And we don't want to make that decision uh, lightly. We wanna make sure that we're doing our due diligence and the thoughtful consideration with all corners of our caucus, right? There is a broad ideologic spectrum. We need everybody's vote. <laughs> so sometimes we do need additional negotiation, but I think uh, we have a very strong leader in the president and we have a great opportunity uh, to deliver some strong legislation for the American people. Just a quick quick follow up on that. Is it frustrating at all to see so much of the caucus united around what you say are these key priorities that will make a difference in Americans everyday lives? And if every day matters, the fact that this is now stretching extra days, weeks, maybe months, does that frustrate you seeing only a few holdouts slow down the entire process? Well, you know, we do know that there are some people that um, are interested in legislating. There's some people that are interested in being on television. There are some people that are interested in being famous. There are some people that are interested in solving problems, tackling these big issues like climate change and some people who just aren't. And so we got to get everybody together. Um, and so this is where we have to govern. And I think some folks are getting adjusted to this real requirement to govern, to deliver. This is not about just taking a stand. This is not about just sending a tweet. This is not about just appearing on a morning show. This is about doing the work. And so, um, you know, am I frustrated? I'll just say I was there months ago. I've been there. You know what I mean? I'm ready to go. I, this is our opportunity to make good on these healthcare promises. And I'm ready to work with anybody and everybody to get it done. Let's pivot into some of those specific policies that you mentioned, Congresswoman, one being drug pricing. The idea that the government, that Medicare, should directly negotiate the prices of prescription drugs. The pharmaceutical industry has said drug innovation would suffer as a result. What is your response to that claim? You know, what I hear pharma trying to argue is that, you know, an elderly Medicare beneficiary who has spent 30, 40 years of their lives uh, working and paying into this system should now have to subsidize their high salaries, have to subsidize their lifestyles because their companies do not want to put their profits into innovation. It is absurd. It's absurd. And so these people try to, you know, bully us. They try to attack us, smear us on television, sending these misleading mailers. The fact is, we are firm in the need for reform. My community understands, my community has my back, and we are ready to go. Do you feel like pharma has tried to bully you on this issue? They tried to bully everybody. Hmm. In person? Is this, or are people this is their MO. <laughs> Well, I, I will not bully you uh, in the spirit of moving on to the next question about a different policy priority, that being coverage expansion. Uh, Democrats want to extend coverage to millions of people, uh, low-income people in some red states for Medicaid expansion. There, there is a lot standing in the way of that plan. It's expensive, it's complicated, there may be legal challenges. At the same time, there are more than 2 million Americans in this Medicaid coverage gap. 60% are people of color. Our conversation today is about equity and affordability. Can Democrats expand, say, Medicare to cover additional benefits like dental and vision while also balancing this goal of expanding coverage through Medicaid and closing the Medicaid gap? What is the higher priority? Well, I think it's really clear that we cannot continue to make policy choices that would leave Americans behind. And right now we know that some states have rem remained 
chronic holdouts and refusing to offer their lowest income residents an opportunity to have high quality comprehensive health care. Um, those are the same states that tend to have severe racial and ethnic disparities and health outcomes across, you know, infectious diseases and chronic diseases, um, you know, mortality rates, things like that. And so, you know, I think it's very important that as we are here to lead, as we are here to bring transformative change, as we are here to build back better, we may Make good on our promise to those Americans who have been seeking an affordable health care option for now a decade, right? Like we're 10 years past the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Those Americans have been isolated, right? They have not had an affordable health care option while so many of us have had uh, options, whether it was Medicaid expansion or taking advantage of the marketplace. And so I'm really excited about this moment. I think that at least among House Democrats, we are very clear on the need uh, to, to do this work. I think that uh, Senate Democrats are very clear, particularly on uh, the opportunity for a political argument to be made <laughs> that uh, the Democrats did deliver on their promise of Medicaid expansion. Uh, when you look at the Senate map, I think it's very important to their political prospects. And so I think that, you know, on Medicaid expansion, we're going to be in very good shape. Just, just to quickly underline this point, this conversation that you and I are having, Congresswoman, it's about equity. And given that Medicaid is the program for low-income Americans, shouldn't expanding Medicaid be the priority when it comes to equity? Well, certainly. I think uh, we have an opportunity, again, to cover low-income Americans who've been left behind. They tend, in these states, we see more health disparities, right? We see, uh, for example, these Southern states that tend to have worse health outcomes across metrics uh, than other states across the country that make other investments in the health and well-being of their residents. And so by taking this action and providing additional resources to cover these Americans, I think it's 12 states, uh, we have an opportunity to make tremendous gains towards affordable, equitable health care. You know, President Biden has said that in all of his policies, he wants to center equity. And that's what this Medicaid policy does. You know, I do a lot of work in the maternal health space and the postpartum Medicaid expansion is one of the areas that we are so excited about, the opportunity to make that policy permanent. Um, that will allow us to save moms lives, which has been our mission in the Black Maternal Health Caucus uh, since we founded it in 2019. And so I'm really excited about this conversation that we're having. Um, for those who are watching that um, are big champions of Medicare expansion, hearing dental vision, listen, nobody in our, in our caucus is putting aside that as a priority. I wanna make it very clear. We understand the severe, the severe barriers for folks to be able to get affordable dental coverage. I, as a nurse, understand the linkage between dental care and other physical health ailments, right? And we know that even persistent pain can be uh, linked to, you know, lack of dental care. I understand all of that. But when we're talking about the dollars that we have available to us with this limited pay for, right, allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices, we're going to have an opportunity for the Medicare beneficiaries to see significant out-of-pocket saving. Significant right, by having their prescription drug costs lower. Um, and we have an opportunity to sort of share the wealth <laughs> and cover more people by allowing the Medicaid um, coverage gap to be closed. Congresswoman, I do have some questions of my own, but I want to go to an audience question. And this is about the COVID-19 pandemic, how it highlighted and exacerbated disparities in healthcare. This question here is from Melissa Kahn in Illinois. It's up on the screen, but just to read it for folks who might not be able to see, what is Congress doing to address the health disparities caused by the pandemic? You know, it's so important that we tackle this question specifically because what we have seen is that we have uh, more, you know, Black people, Hispanic people, Native people, Asian Americans more likely to get COVID, more likely to get severe disease, more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to die, you know, and we're seeing uh, these disparities persist. 
We're also seeing communities of color lag behind in vaccination rates. Uh, we're seeing those communities of color continue to be disproportionately impacted by the virus. And so, you know, the Congress through the American Rescue Plan, through the December 2020 COVID uh, relief bill, we did make some key investments like billions of dollars in getting shots in arms and putting people to work and really um, accelerating this response to the pandemic. And I have been so pleased by President Biden and his administration administration's efforts to center equity in this COVID response, uh, recognizing that all communities didn't quite experience the pandemic equally, even though the virus right itself kind of uh, moves the same from person to person. Um, we know that some communities did have disproportionate death. And so I'm excited that they're going to continue to make investments in scaling up testing, for example, continue to be creative and doing outreach uh, around the vaccine, continue to um, be responsive to the rampant misinformation um, that, you know, continues to spread very heavily, at least among the Black community. It's really dangerous, uh, this misinformation. And, you know, I hope that uh, we will continue to see uh, dramatic improvements. I think that this embrace of um, bringing in private industry and private employers as partners in the vaccine effort is good. And I think that the news um, that'll be coming around children's vaccination will also likely help uh, improve vaccine rates among these key communities. Since we're talking about vaccination and because you're a nurse, I, I was curious about this issue of vaccination mandates in healthcare. There have been moves by some state boards of nursing uh, rules that would require nurses to get vaccinated or lose their license, possibly face fines in states like New York or Oregon. These are uh, mandates that are being pursued or have already been put into place. What are your thoughts, Congresswoman? Should, should healthcare workers and nurses specifically be required to get vaccinated against COVID? Well, healthcare workers are required to be vaccinated against many things, I can tell you, because I've been vaccinated against basically everything. And so I think it's absolutely reasonable to add COVID-19 vaccines to that list. We have uh, vaccines that are approved by the FDA, they are safe and effective, um, and they work. And the American people enter into our healthcare systems in times of need, in times of desperation, in times of crisis, and they are expecting their health providers to take care of them, not to spread illness to them. So um, I, I fully support vaccination. I have been vaccinated myself, and um, I think that these requirements are very reasonable. Democrats are moving forward on the budget reconciliation package. There are issues around the debt ceiling. COVID vaccination remains central, and President Biden is trying to balance all of these priorities. If you got time with the president and he was asking for your advice on a health care issue, how would you guide him in this moment? How should he be spending his time and what sort of leadership do Democrats need from the president right now? Well, I will tell you what I told the president, which is we have an opportunity to make permanent the very popular tax cuts that he passed, well, that he signed into law in the American Rescue Plan. Uh, my bill, the Healthcare Affordability Act, that says that no American would pay more than eight and a half percent of their income on premiums for silver level marketplace plans. So that's good coverage, Dan. Those are the plans that people want. They're not the high deductible plans or, you know, the things that people complain about. These are the good plans. Well, guess what? After the American Rescue Plan was signed into law in March, President Biden himself issued a what we call a special enrollment period, which allowed the American people to sign up for new coverage right away. Over 3 million Americans signed up since the spring, taking advantage of that special enrollment period, using the new rates, these tax cuts expansions that we got signed into law for two years. That says to me, that the American people understand the improvements that we're making uh, to make good on our promise to offer them affordable health care. It means that they are excited about the new choices that they have uh, when, some, when picking health care plans on the marketplace. And instead of just kicking the can down the road and maybe offering a three or five year extension, we can make this permanent. Um, I, I, 
emphasize to the president that the American people understand Medicare negotiating drug prices, that the American people understand lowering their health care premium costs. They understand what a tax cut means and that all three of those things are very popular. And so as we're pursuing this health care agenda, trying to be high impact for the American people, translating these wins into things that the American people can experience right away, we have an opportunity for three slam dunks with this policy. And um, he understood. I think he supports this idea. And in a in a conversation about priorities and trade-offs, this is something that's not controversial. Congresswoman, in our final 30 seconds, the issues we're talking today all have to do with equity. It's an issue that resonates with Americans on a personal level. That's what the polling tells us. I'm just curious for you, how is how is healthcare affordability and trying to get quality care. How is that personal for you? Oh, it's very personal for me. I have a pre-existing condition. You know, I know what it means to um, be worried that I would lose my health care. You know, I'm 35 years old and remember what it was like before the ACA. And, you know, when in insurance companies could, you know, discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions, when, you know, we could be charged more. Um, and I know what it means to worry about being able to afford my medication. And so this whole conversation is very, very important to me. Um, in the same way that the conversation that we have about maternal health and the opportunity to save mom's lives is very important to me. Um, and so I am laser focused on making Got sure it, so that the Build Better Act is done. Well, we are, we are out of time, so we'll have to leave it on that note. But Congresswoman Underwood, thank you so much for joining us on Washington Post Live. Thank you. And I'll be back with Dr. Richard Besser of RWJF in a few minutes. Please stay with us. The toughest of times brought out the best in us. And thanks to the collaboration between our scientists, the government, and others, each day millions of COVID-19 vaccine shots are protecting us. But we still face challenges, which is why America's biopharmaceutical scientists are working to combat variants, find new treatments, and make as many vaccines as the world needs. So while you do your part, we'll continue to do ours. Pharma, our work continues. Hello, I'm Elise Labbitt from American University, and today we're talking about removing barriers that stand between patients and their badly needed health care. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has really reinforced the value that America's biopharmaceutical industry has contributed to combating the pandemic. Now the challenge is to deliver a more resilient, affordable, and equitable health care system. Joining me to talk about this is Lori Riley. She's Pharma's Chief Operating Officer. Lori, great to have you. Great to be here. Now, I know at Pharma you've done a lot of research on the patient experience that's showing that health insurance isn't exactly providing the security and access it's meant to, especially for the sick and vulnerable. So talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing. Well, first of all, thanks for that question. And unfortunately, you're exactly right. Uh, we recently concluded some uh, research that will be out later this week. And what that research found is that about a third of patients, and these are patients with insurance, are saying that they are struggling financially to afford the health care that they need. And that means they're struggling to pay their deductibles as well as their out-of-pocket costs like their co-pays when they go to the pharmacy counter. Uh, so this is a real problem for patients and one that I think we absolutely need to put greater attention and focus to. So it sounds like it's not just a Band-Aid that needs to be put on a problem, but we're talking about some kind of systemic change that's needed so the system works better for patients. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. I will say what we've seen over the last decade or so is more and more costs that are being shifted on to the patient. Um, and, and I can tell you on the prescription drug side that 
Just last year, for example, we saw drug prices actually decline by almost 3%, but we haven't seen that roll over from the patient experience. In other words, patients aren't paying less when they go to the pharmacy counter. Instead, what they're seeing is higher deductibles year after year, higher copays for their medicine year after year, and that translates into challenges financially to afford their medicines. And not only are they financially challenged oftentimes, but they're actually access barriers that are also coming into play that are making it harder for them to get the medicines they need. Uh, these access challenges come in the way of utilization management techniques that insurance company uses, use. Um, and these can be everything from, you know, asking a patient to fail on multiple therapies before they get the medicine they need. And what our research found is if you're a patient with diabetes, with a genetic disorder or an autoimmune disease, you face more of these challenges relative to other patients. And if you happen to be a Black American or a Hispanic American, according to the survey, the majority of those populations have faced those challenges relative to about a third of their white counterparts. So we've got, you know, again, financial issues and access issues, but they're playing out uh, that in a way that often pre prevents people from getting access to the therapies that they need. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the point of inequity because I think we're seeing that due to the pandemic, like the healthcare system, these inequities have really been laid bare. So talk to us about how COVID has really exacerbated these problems with inequity. Yeah, according to the survey work that we did, about 40% of Americans now are anxious about their ability to afford the care that they need. And as you, as you pointed out, COVID is a big driver of that. Um, we've recognized within our industry that we need to do more uh, to move towards a more just and equitable society. Uh, we released, for example, earlier this year, a proactive agenda. And one of the issues that we focused on there uh, that relates to our industry is on clinical trial diversity, ensuring that as our industry conducts important clinical trials to bring, where, whether it's COVID vaccines and therapies or medicines for oncology, patients or diabetes patients, that those trials need to reflect the patients they're designed to help and treat. So as an industry, we're making a more concerted effort to ensure that our trials are reflective of the population. But there's lots of other issues that, that quite honestly, as a country, we need to be focused on to move towards a more just and equitable healthcare system. So it sounds like the policy discussion here in Washington needs to kind of address the issues we're discussing in a meaningful way so that we can build some more resilience into the system. Absolutely. You know, there is a large debate going on right now on Capitol Hill. And our hope is that that discussion actually focuses more on addressing some of these systemic issues, addressing issues like out of pocket costs, getting deductibles down, getting cost sharing down to levels where patients aren't abandoning their medicine, but can actually afford their medicine. Uh, right now, some of the policies that Congress is looking at, I fear would go in the other direction. Policies like government price setting. Instead, we'd love to see Congress focusing on things like establishing an out-of-pocket maximum for prescription drugs and lowering the price that seniors have to pay when they go to the pharmacy counter by lowering their coinsurance and copays. Those are two ways. There's lots of other ways that we think if Congress put a concerted effort, they would do a lot to help America's seniors better afford the therapies that they that they absolutely need. Well, I mean, it's promising that there are vaccines and treatments against these challenging diseases being developed. And, you know, I think COVID showed that America's pharmaceutical industry is really leading the way. But you make an important point that these innovations are meaningless if the patients don't have access to them. So Lori, Lori Riley, Pharma's Chief Operating Officer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Elise. We'll throw it back to the Washington Post.
Welcome back. I'm Dan Diamond of The Post. And my next guest is Dr. Richard Besser. He's president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. He served as the acting director of the CDC under President Obama, and he is returning to the program. Doctor, welcome back to Washington Post Live. Thanks so much. It's great to be here with you, Dan. Doctor, I want to talk about the health reform efforts happening on the Hill, but first start with the innovation happening out in the field with health care delivery. During the pandemic, we've seen a number of innovations, new vaccines, drive-through testing, telehealth, and so on. What is your assessment of how health delivery has changed during these past 20 months? Well, you know, I, you, you lift up some exciting innovations. Uh, I, I'm a general pediatrician and, and volunteer in, in a pediatric clinic, and I've seen it play out there. Uh, the, the broader use of telemedicine um, is something that I think is, is quite exciting and something that, that will stay. One of the things that I heard from uh, providers at our, our clinic in Trenton um, is that when it, when it comes to, to mental health services, uh, there are quite a number of, of patients who use those services who are more comfortable uh, connecting with their therapist over, over telehealth than they are coming into the clinic. Uh, many patients who were, were viewed as uh, non-compliant and lost a follow-up, uh, when it became easier to get care through telemedicine, uh, all of a sudden they weren't lost to follow up. What was was holding them back was uh, challenges in terms of transportation and transportation systems, uh, jobs that may not allow them time off work uh, for for healthcare visits. So this is something I, I find quite exciting. It, it, it you know the the downside of it is it exposes. The, the incredible divide we have in our nation in terms of, of digital access. Um, your income will determine to a great degree uh, whether or not you have broadband coverage that is really important for, for being to, able to access the, those services. Um, I'm excited about the, the technologies that have, have borne fruition in terms of, of vaccines. The, the, the use of the uh, mRNA vaccines is really built on decades of basic science research uh, funded in large part by by tax dollars, um, that has allowed these vaccines to to come to fruition. I you know at the beginning of this pandemic, the idea that we would have uh, three vaccines that were approved for use uh, in in a year after a new infectious agent was was identified to me, I, I thought was absolutely a non-starter. Uh, vaccines generally take three to five years from from start to to finish to be to be out there. Uh, but without cutting corners in terms of safety, without cutting corners in terms of regulatory oversight, uh, we had three vaccines that were, were going into people uh, and changing the trajectory of the pandemic within a year. And that gives me hope for the future because you know, while uh, we're in the midst of this pandemic and it's impossible to predict when it will be over, we will see future pandemics. We will see new infectious agents arise. And to have the ability to, to think about vaccines coming to fruition that quickly um, can change the, the whole approach to, to managing those types of crises. I, I ran emergency preparedness and response at the CDC for, for four years um, and never would have imagined that we would be able to think about vaccines coming, coming that quickly. So those are just two areas where, where I think uh, we, we see some innovations uh, that, that hopefully will stick that are, that are very exciting. I want to come back to the vaccination push, but you mentioned on mental health care, the value of telehealth and making connections. And for folks who might have dropped off, how easy it is to stay in touch or easier, I suppose. But I'm curious, doctor, about the quality of care. Do we know that the quality of a telehealth visit for mental health delivers equivalent care? I can see the value, I suppose, of unburdening yourself to a, a screen, but you're also losing some human connection. What do we know about the quality of telehealth care? Yeah, you know, the, those studies have to, have to be done. You know, anecdotally talking to, to a colleague who's a psychiatrist, um, she finds that a, a number of her patients really enjoy that interaction. Uh, there are others who don't. There's others who don't like the use of technology and really value the in-person. And so uh, I don't think it will ever be a one-size-fits-all. You know, as, as a pediatrician, um, I know that that it's so important that I'm able to lay hands on a child and truly uh, examine them, listen to listen to their heart, 
uh, uh, be in the room in terms of developing a relationship with with a parent uh, and with a child, that in person uh, uh, contact uh, contact and experience is is so important. As, as we're looking now, Dan, and we're seeing challenges in terms of trust. Uh, who do you trust? Where do you get trusted information? I do think that 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 in person experience is really important for that. You can read body language. You can spend additional time. Uh, just the act of pulling over a chair and sitting down uh, with a child, with a parent, um, is an act of, of, of respect uh, that's much harder to translate into a telehealth visit that is more and more transactional. Well, I'm also curious because you're a practicing physician and I know you're in a clinic, what percentage of your visits, doctor, are telehealth at this point? 10%, well, 30%, zero? Yeah, so um, I'm a volunteer pediatrician. I've, I've been a volunteer pediatrician for, for decades. Um, and so all of my visits are in person. And that's mainly because uh, the challenge for me of learning the telehealth system there um, wasn't worth it. I, I much preferred to have the in, inpatient contact in, in the clinic. In terms of the clinicians who are there, uh, for for the majority of the pandemic period, all of their visits were were telehealth uh, because the the clinic wasn't set up to be able to have uh, infection control protocols in in place. Um, now it's it, it's a mix, and so I you know I, I don't know if it's fifty fifty, but they're moving towards uh, more and more visits being uh, in in person. Um, but I hope that there will always be the telehealth option because sometimes it's it's a parent who just has a question, wants to connect. Um, you know, in America, uh, there are so many working people who don't have sick leave, don't have uh, family medical leave. And so asking someone to take time off work uh, to come in with a child to, to be seen when it's something that could be handled uh, um, through a telehealth uh, visit, um, is is not something that you you want everyone to have have to do because people then will not get the care uh, that they need uh, because of the 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 structural barriers and those barriers are not spread out evenly across America. Uh, 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 black black individuals, Latino individuals are much more likely to be in jobs uh, that do not uh, provide uh, sick leave and 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 family medical leave and and that's something that needs to change. Mm. I also know that with telehealth and Zoom, we don't always know how tall the other person is on the other end of the video connection. And having met you in person, uh, you, you are on the tall end of physicians that I know. Um, let's pivot out from telehealth to a broader conversation about priorities for health reform. And right now on Capitol Hill, there is a significant debate over what does it mean to make healthcare more affordable, more accessible, more equitable. When you are looking at the priorities that are being discussed, whether Medicare expansion, Medicaid, and so on, what are those key priorities, doctor, to making healthcare more affordable in America? Yeah, you know, as a starting point, Dan, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we believe that, that healthcare access is, is, is a right. Um, and, and there are many ways to get to universal healthcare coverage. Um, but but if we can agree uh, that everyone everyone should have access to high quality, comprehensive, affordable health care, um, then we can work together to figure out, OK, how are we going to get there? Right now, there's a lot of discussion around what's called the, the, the Medicaid gap. Uh, when the Affordable Care Act was was passed, it provided resources to, to states to expand those people who had access to, to Medicaid, which which. Medicaid in America is the largest health insurance uh, provider. It provides care for low-income individuals. It provides care for people with disabilities. It's the largest provider of, of nursing home and long-term care uh, uh, for, for the elderly. Um, and in the Affordable Care Act, it, it allowed uh, states to expand uh, the, the income requirements for, for Medicaid. So uh, that meant that more people could get covered. And uh, 38 states said, great, this is incredible. We want to give more coverage to people who live in our state. 12 states have not done so. And when you look at those states, uh, those states have, have uh, 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 2.2 million people in them who would get health care coverage if Medicaid was, was expanded. Disproportionately, this is affecting people of color. Uh, in America, 15% uh, of the population um, are, are, are black. 28% of the people who are affected by the, this Medi what's called the Medicaid gap are black. Uh, 
In America, 18% of people are, are Latino, 28% of people affected by, the Medi by this Medicaid uh, coverage gap are, are uh, Latino. And if you think about it, you know, if, if in America there were a group of states that were saying, we're going to withhold food and we're going to withhold water from a segment of our population, we would look to the federal government to say that's unacceptable. We're going to step in and fix it. Yet we accept 12 states in our country saying we are not going to provide uh, health care coverage to people who live here. And it, it's time that the federal government takes this on and, and solves it so that so that 2.2 million people can can get this this, this care. Because you know the, the the studies have been done to show the impact of this. When you expand access to health care coverage, you you improve the health outcome, which is which is something you would expect to, to see there. Um, you improve the longevity of life. Uh, you provo you improve the economy. If people are are spending less money for their their own health care, uh, what you see is that they have more dollars to spend in the local economy, and so that's a boom uh, a as well. When one of the things we've seen in, in COVID, but it, it 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 translates even in non-pandemic times, is that if you don't have health care insurance, you're going to wait longer to come in for care. And if you do that, it means many times that your disease has progressed. You know, you're someone who has a slightly high blood sugar, but you don't go in to get it get it uh, checked. Uh, when you do show up in the emergency room because you you have uh, full blown diabetes, your prospects aren't as good. Same thing for getting your blood pressure checked, for getting your routine screens, for developing a trusted relationship. Those things all really matter. You know, Representative Underwood was talking about maternal health care in America. And in America, the prospects for black women and white women are extremely different. In our country, uh, the, the chances that a black woman will, will die during pregnancy or from pregnancy-related uh, complications um, exceeds that for white, white, white women by, by twofold. Uh, the chances that a, that a black woman will lose an infant in the first year of life double again. And when you think about it, you know, we do provide a lot of Medicaid coverage uh, for women when they're pregnant. Uh, but you want to make sure that a woman is coming into pregnancy healthy. And to do that, you have to expand Medicaid. That's one of the ways to, to do that. But the, the health care crisis in America is not limited to Medicaid. When you talk to people who have, who have health insurance, you know, over the past decade, people have seen the amount that they have to pay, their premiums going up. You've seen their deductibles, the amount that they have to pay, uh, they have to cover before their insurance kicks in uh, is going up. So we have a health care crisis in America, and it's time for the federal government to fix it. Well, doctor, you get to some issues that go beyond just Medicaid, this broader issue of the safety net. I want to bring in a question from the audience here that I think speaks to this issue. This is from Robert who lives in Georgia, and I'll read the question for those who can't see, it's on the screen. How do you approach health equity without addressing housing, justice, and education equity? Well, you know, to answer Robert, you, you don't. And, and one of the things we're trying to do at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is to broaden the conversation around what does it take to be healthy in America? You know, clearly, it's very hard to be healthy in America if you don't have access to high quality, comprehensive, affordable health care. Uh, but if that's all you're talking about, you're going to continue to see the, the incredible disparities we see in America. You know, in, over the past year, life expectancy in America uh, dropped uh, by, by a little over a year. If you break it down by race, um, uh, for, for Black Americans, for Latino Americans, it dropped by about three years. You know, we are one of the wealthiest nations in America, uh, and yet we rank 46th in terms of life expectancy. And if you look at the factors behind that uh, and the questions about housing and education and justice, uh, they, pay, they play a big role in terms of people's opportunities and people's prospects in, in, in terms of health. You know, you can't expect somebody to uh, lead a healthy life if they don't have an income that allows them to, to, uh, to buy those things that are absolutely essential. Uh, you know, as a pediatrician, I spend a lot of time talking to parents about nutrition and healthy food. And you know, one of the things that became clear to me in my conversations, my, my, my clinic patients uh, are largely uh, um, lower income on Medicaid or uninsured. What's become clear to me is that the, the, the moms I'm, I'm primarily talking to they understand what you're supposed to have on a healthy plate for their children. 
Um, but what they don't understand is how you can expect them to buy that uh, if they're if they're uh, being paid a minimum wage in in America, because a minimum wage is not a living wage. You know, as a foundation, we've had a lot of focus ar around childhood obesity and the lack of the access to uh, uh, healthy food in communities. But what's become clear is, you know, health is about more than 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 personal choice. The choices we make depend on the choices we have. And if you're not being paid a living wage, you don't have a choice to, to really provide healthy food for your children. If you're limited to a neighborhood that isn't safe for your children to go out and play, um, you're, you don't have a choice in terms of getting your child the hour of exercise that CDC recommends. And a lot of that has to do with housing in America. And if you look at housing in America, you can't look at that today without looking back at history. Uh, to see why our neighborhoods are as segregated as they are and look at the intentional segregation of America uh, that's taken place over 100 years. Um, that kind of structural racism has limited the, the opportunities for so many people in our country. And if you don't work to address that intentionally, um, you, we're going to continue to see the disparate impact on people's lives, on their health that we see in America today. Yeah, some disturbing structural problems in healthcare for sure. We only have a couple minutes left. So I wanted to get your opinion, doctor, on some news that broke yesterday about coronavirus uh, response. The US government is going to purchase a billion dollars in rapid at-home testing, make those tests more broadly available. I spoke with public health experts who said, this move is overdue. I'm curious for your opinion, has the US response relied too much on vaccinations and not enough on, say, rapid testing? Well, you know, I, I think the, the U.S. strategy uh, assumed that there would be a much broader vaccine uptake than, than we've seen. And, you know, the, the politicization of response, I think, um, is absolutely tragic. Uh, Francis Collins, uh, the, the head of the National Institutes of Health, who will be leaving soon, has, has talked about that as something uh, that caught him by surprise. But the, the idea uh, that people would reject uh, vaccines, a life-saving measure, uh, is not something, you know, to the degree that they were, they've been rejected, was not something that was planned on. But the, the, to get to the heart of your question, I, I do think uh, that testing could play a much bigger role uh, than it has. It should play a bigger role than it has. You know, imagine if, if we had um, low cost or free testing available for everyone in America. You could get up in the morning, do your COVID test. Uh, if you're negative, you go to work, your kids go to school. If you're positive, you stay home. That would be a very different type of response than, than, than we've seen and one that could have great impact that the FDA is having to make in terms of vaccines. Just the, in, the, in, the, in this month, there'll be three meetings to consider uh, uh, vaccines for children. They'll be considering additional boosters. You need to have stability within the FDA, and that starts with having someone at the top who can help uh, the American people uh, 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 feel that, that science is, is ruling the day. It, it can inspire trust. Very important to have those positions uh, filled uh, and for those those individuals to ensure uh, that the the regulatory process, the scientific review process, is one uh, that is not impacted uh, by politics. Well, we are out of time, so we will have to leave it on that note. But thank you so much for speaking with us, Dr. Richard Besser. It was a fascinating conversation, as always. Thanks so much. It's a, a real pleasure to to be here with you, Dan. And thank you for tuning in to Washington Post Live today. If you'd like to check out what other programs we have on tap, you can go to WashingtonPostLive.com. That is WashingtonPostLive.com to register and see about our upcoming programs. I'm Dan Diamond of The Post. Thank you, as always, for joining us.